Audrey Hepburn was not like any other actor or actress out there. She just had magnetism. People loved her. I mean, there were wonderful female stars at the time, but there was nothing quite like her. What's, what's the moment when, in some way, the mask slips? What are those other kind of like personal, more intimate moments? What do they look like? How do they feel? In Audrey's life, there was a lot of conflict, and you know, she had a certain sort of sadness about her. If I've been successful, the audience, the people, see something that I don't see. She and Mel had a long, fairly happy marriage, but they sort of drifted apart. She is a perfect example of somebody who was an artist and dedicated herself to her art and found her true calling through the art of love and giving love to those who didn't have it, just as she experienced when she was a child. I think she had to kind of prove to herself that unconditional love was possible. John Hepburn Ferrer, it's an honor to speak to you, especially more in depth in reference to a new documentary about Audrey Hepburn, your mom, in this case, Audrey, more than an icon. Uh, we don't usually get to see you in documentaries about your mom, but what made you want to be a part of this one? Um, it actually starts with my desire to celebrate her 90th birthday anniversary. And to do that, I created an exhibition called Intimate Audrey, which opened in Brussels last year for her birthday, then went on to Amsterdam. You know, she was born in Brussels and then went on to Amsterdam, where uh, she spent the war. And it's called Intimate Audrey because I took away all of the Hollywood side of it, you know. And I wanted to bring home the woman, the woman who was born in the case of Brussels there 90 years before and who left 80, three years you know, before. And so I thought, <clears throat> everybody knows the photographs from it, but, you know, they'd like to know who she was, what she became, what she thought, her writings and all of that. So uh, together with that, uh, Nick came to see me, Nick Kutausig from Salon, and he said, we'd like to do a film about who your mo mother really was. So it's sort of, you know, I said, I'd love to help you. I'll do what I can, you know. Um, so it sort of fell into place in a, in a lovely way because it was sort of organic to what, um, you know, and for the exhibition, I did a little children's book, uh, which we may talk about later if you'd like, but uh, which is also sort of a biography seen through the imagination of a little girl. So it all sort of fell into place and it seemed sort of to work out. I did get a chance to actually see the children's book. We can talk about it now. Uh, little Audrey's Daydream. What was the, what made you want to bring up like a, a children's book? I don't think that would be like the most common thing to, you know, bring her story in. Actually, when I did the exhibition, having done many exhibitions over the years before, I didn't want to do another catalog. You know, catalogs are, unless you really have something vital that needs to be memorialized, um, I just didn't want to uh, have another book that goes on a coffee table and you move it around as you're cleaning. So the edges curl up and then finally you put it in the library, never looked at it again. So I thought, you know, over the past 20 years, her base has experienced this extraordinary migration to young tweens and teens, who of course now are becoming young adults. And I thought I should do something for all these young kids. I mean, Pretty soon they'll have kids and so it'd be nice to have a story. Other people had done them, you know, some lovely, some not so great. And, uh, but I thought I do one and, and found this extraordinary couple of illustrators. Uh, and unfortunately, the woman, Dominique, had cancer. So it was even more meaningful that she spent the last months of her life. Of course, uh, my mother was an idol for her and her husband. So these were happy times, you know, in between one treatment in the other and with the daughter's coloring and all of that. So it was really a very meaningful family effort. And uh, self-published it for the exhibition at 1,000 copies that sold at the little shop. And then someone 
you know, got it. That, you know, publishers are very structured in America. They want you to make books for three to six or six to nine, or, you know. And I wanted to do something for the family. I wanted to be a little bit like Shrek, you know, where there's layers for kids, but also for adults. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's for the child and all of us. And uh, I think it works. I think it's, it's lovely. Um, and um, ex never planned, of course, this pandemic, never even had an inkling that this would happen. But especially in a time like this, to read about a little girl who went through the war and lost all the things you take for granted, the ability to cross the street, to go out, to do this and that, to have to stay in bed because there's no food and no heating and to preserve your calories. There's a lot of parallel, wonderful parallel things um, that you find in that little book, which sort of also fell in our lap and in an unexpected kind of a fashion. Indeed, uh, I did have a chance to read it. I don't have kids, but that is even something that even adults can read. It's a nice uh, feeling good type of book for any age. Uh, ab absolutely, you know, I always say, you know, that the, that the, the, the Japanese uh, 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 Sanrio characters, uh, Hello Kitty, you know, it started off from little babies, mm -hmm. but women wear Hello Kitty t-shirts under their Chanel suit, you know, today. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think that that's going to be the case for Little Audrey, but I'm trying to say it, that's where it should fit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's it's a for all ages. And the interesting part about the, the book is that it cover it kind of goes parallel to, like you said, times today but also with the, with the documentary, you know, it covers even, you know, having to um, put messages in her books, you know, to send the messages. Like that's not something you would typically read in a kid's book. You mean in her shoes, yeah, yeah. 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 No, absolutely, yes. Well, she did, she did. I mean, and of course in the book, um, she used to say that she didn't know what the messages contained. And at first she thought that they were little love notes, you know, that were only for the people who were in love with her to read. And of course, here's a good example. We all know that these are messages from the resistance and they're using kids because the soldiers won't stop the kids, you know. Uh, but that's a nice, you know, you can stop reading and saying, you know, in actual fact, you know, I know what these, what these messages were about. And the kid gets all sort of fascinated, you know, and, they, they, and you start, it, it's, a, it's a history lesson. It's a history lesson, um, um, and so is the documentary. You know, extraordinary people keep saying to me, "I didn't know your mother had a miscarriage," and I said, "Many women have miscarriages," and I sort of, you know, she was very private. She probably would sort of be, you know, she wouldn't have. I mean, she talked about it obviously because it's in the documentary, but I also wanted to, you know, sort of reinforce that because. You can be someone like that and have an extraordinary life and yet also live all the hardships and get through all the hardships that regular people go through. You know, she was a regular person. And in a, th in, in a way, that may be the secret of why she's so enduring is because we perceive her as, her as one of us rather than Elizabeth Taylor, who's in that Parthenon of Hollywood, you know, uh, my mother's really the girl from across the landing with the little black dress and uh, we, we're rooting for her. Mm -hmm. Which part of the documentary for this one in particular would you say was your favorite? Oh, undoubtedly, um, I, I, we were desperately clawing around to find footage that had never been seen. And uh, m my lawyer, Michael Crane, represents um, also the Cooper estate. Maria Cooper is a friend. We know, we know each other quite well maybe not friends, but we know each other well. And of course they had spent a lot of time because you know she did the last film with Gary, he was sick and he was dying. And they spent time and of course there's this wonderful piece of, and there's a photograph that we have and they've had for years where it's a photograph of Gary holding an old Bolex eight millimeter, 16 millimeter, whatever it is. So I said, well, he's not just holding it as a prop, there's gotta be a piece of film somewhere. And so we dug it up. And of course, my dad is clowning around at a barbecue and all of that. And it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's not all of it made it into the documentary. But of course, 
son of two people who got divorced, when you see them up there happy, you know, I remember them with the music and the candlelight and, you know, people wore house dresses in those days. It was like so long sort of with buttons on the front, something like an elegant bathrobe or something like this, you know, and uh, at the, five, the 50s and the 60s were a funny time. But, but so it, it's wonderful to remember the good stuff. That's part of that. I got to talk to Helena a couple of days ago in reference to the documentary. I mean, she told she even tells me her finding of a two-hour recording that had never been found. That's think about think about it because it's actually we don't have that many family photos because we were not a very Hollywood sort of family take, you know, when you're in front of the camera and one of the most photographed women of the 20th century, you know, uh, you don't, at Christmas time, you don't want photos. Right. She had an old Instamatic and she took pictures, you know, which I have, of, of pictures of her gardens and her roses, a few thousand of those. But, um, so someone who's always been interviewed with video finally gets a long interview that's just sound. So it, she's even more relaxed. And what a wonderful base to use, you know, sort of a click track to build something visual upon something that was never planned to be visual and has that sort of relaxed quality of, uh, you know, of, of sound only. And I think that's precious that she found that. By the way, you have lovely Christmas tree in the background. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be festive. <laughs> yes. um, so what was your feel when you heard this audio? Because I personally, as the viewer, I got to watch a documentary, a good portion of it, it's Audrey narrating her story. Yeah. Um, so for you, what was your experience actually listening to this, this audio? Well, you know, having been, you know, uh, managing her image and likeness and documentaries and exhibitions and all of these things for the past pretty soon it'll be 30 years you know uh, it's 28 years now since she passed away it'll, it'll be 28 years in January um, I, I'm used to living with her voice around somewhere and of course she's everywhere you can go into a salon or walk into an airport I mean, she's there on the cover of a magazine or in an ad or something like that. And whether it's authorized or not, that's a different story. So I'm used to walking into a hotel room in Tokyo, turning on the TV and there she is. So, um, but there's, a, there's a, when Nick came to me, I realized that this would be something more than the just TV documentary that, you know, the video edit and they were getting a film size budget to do this with, and it would be a movie. It would be a movie and there would be the care and the time and the ability to do something that was creatively interesting, which I think there was, I mean, I've, I've seen seven or eight different cuts and I've always told them what I thought. You know, there were some that were more political and angrier from, you know, the, the UNICEF work and um, there's been different iterations, but I think it's found sort of a lovely balance Definitely. So you mentioned right now UNICEF, I was going to mention it um, and ask you, so you've actually been, you know, continuing this work in her name, if not mistaken. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I mean, uh, we created, the first thing we created was the Memorial Fund at UNICEF, which then grew up, you know, into a program called All Children in School, which was managed by the Foundation in America and ultimately sort of grew up into the Audrey Hepburn Society, which was the big donors club at, at the UNICEF, US Fund for UNICEF, which I chaired for the last five years, uh, or for, for its fi five year existence and raised almost $200 million. You know, so sort of, sort of continuation of her work. We have had a foundation in Switzerland, which managed a uh, small pavilion in our hometown. You know, I have an association there, I have one in Brussels, which manages this exhibition, and I'm giving the funds to um, of the exhibition and the book to Eurotis because my mother died of a, our, our mother died of a of a rare form of cancer that only touches one in a million people, or only affects one in a million people. And so, you know, they're working for you know 
60 million people living with conditions, rare conditions and diseases across the world or across Europe and North America. There's many more across the world. It's hard to get real numbers. Um, so I think it's becoming part of the culture of the family. My brother is doing his things. I'm doing my things. We're passing it on to the next generations. Um, once you receive that gift and you learn, to, you know, it's like being politically active in the right sense. That is, I mean, by, you know, exercising the rights we're given, the luxury of democracy, which needs education and care. And you can't just take it for granted. You know, it's like your teeth. If you just let them be there, they'll go away. You know, so uh, the same thing with, with uh, you know, the environment. The same thing with uh, others, which is really all this is about. It's about, you know, if we are going to be globalized, um, we better really mean it and really talk to talk and walk the walk. And, and part of that is not just ch charity is a horrible thing. It's a last ditch effort, tragedy, you know, can't do anything else. She said it 30 years ago, we need 1% of the global GDP, we can educate these people and give them the power and the ability to help themselves. So somehow we didn't get it together. Certainly not from a lack of resources, certainly because of a lack of will and somehow not prioritizing. And the same thing we're doing to the, to the uh, environment and the same thing it appears we're doing with the administrations of, of our countries. It appears that we're going back to not having learned anything from history. It's very sad. It's very sad and it's, it's very true. Um, I hope, you know, this brings awareness that we need to learn from, from history and really take part in making better actions. Um, I, want, I do want to ask this personal question. Please. Do you think in the future you would be bring an exhibition for Audrey Hepburn to, to the U.S.? I'm in L.A. Yes, um, yes. yes, we are, we, are, we are right now talking to we have a wonderful uh, English, uh, African English lady who's uh, uh, helping me to set up the exhibition in London because that's where she went after. And then once we've done that, we're sort of free. We do have the man with whom I worked and uh, the, the other three exhibitions I've done, brought them to Japan, is finding me a slot in Japan for 22. Uh, so at some point we'll either, if we come to New York, we'll have to come to LA. This is all, pandemic permitting, a PP as the new sort of, you know, um, we'll see. I don't have huge uh, expectations. I don't like to set myself up for, you know, I don't have huge expectations from these vaccines. I don't think that we can put all of our eggs in one basket. I think we need to look at a variety of immune enhancing alternatives, including, including my wife is drumming away at mega doses of vitamin C, which we just got an article uh, out of Australia a week ago about a man who was dying from COVID. And you know, doctors have to give you the protocol and, um, and, and they're not allowed legally to give you something that's not what everybody agrees upon. Mm -hmm. So only when you're about to croak can you just sort of start to get a little creative. And they gave this man massive doses. This is intravenously, and he walked away two weeks later. So, um, you know, it's going to be a combination of things, but it's going to be a holistic, without a doubt, because it's all interconnected. It's all interconnected. It's not about pointing fingers who did it, who was on first, who was on second, but no doubt the solution will be as organic mm -hmm. as the mystery as to how it um, sort of came to be. Yeah, at this point, I guess we, we just have to adapt um, to this living condition um, and go from there. But thank you for giving that little hope that we'll see something over here. Um, that would be definitely something to look forward to. Yeah, I haven't done it with the other exhibitions, so I sort of have a debt of credit with Los Angeles. You know, I lived there for 25 years. Oh, this is like so, home too. Yeah, exactly. You know, I lived in the Hollywood Hills and then in Santa Monica. And, so, and then in, in Malibu, all the way down to Point Doom. I'm at <clears throat> Sherman Oak, so you know where, we, where I am. Of course I know where you are. 
I used to go, my dad had a ranch in Carpinteria, so I used to drive the 101, the 101 yeah. over and take, you know, the, the 10 out to see him. But um, so, yes, I have a debt sort of toward Los Angeles, so maybe this is the one to bring. And since it's completely devoid of Hollywood, how refreshing to bring a star of that magnitude, but really only about the person and not about the celeb part. Indeed, indeed. Well, thank you so much for your time. I do okay. have to admit, I did shed a couple of tears. Usually we don't cry in documentaries. We all pretty much kind of know the outcome. However, you being in it made it very organic. I think my daughter, my daughter is the one who got people to shed a tear. I think. Oh, it was her? Well, you speaking about your mom was very, like, oh, it just... Look, I'm, I'm gonna start getting teary again. So thank you so much for making a, a, being part of it and making it a different kind of documentary. My, than my, pleasure, before. my pleasure. Thank you so much for helping us to continue to tell the story. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time.